Welcome to the Liberty Insider. This is a program for you, giving you up-to-date news, information, discussion, and analysis of religious liberty events in the US and around the world. My name is Lincoln Steed, editor of Liberty Magazine, and my guest on this program is Professor John Reeve, uh, chair of the uh, church, uh, church History Department at Andrews University. Yes. Um, Let's try something. When we talk about religious liberty, the counter of it often, especially in the West, is a faction, sometimes a whole government that's dedicated toward remoralizing society and projecting a particular, usually an aspect of faith on the, on the community. But you know, how can we be so sure that an individual or, or a faction or a government when it's dealing with faith matters really even knows what's right? They, they probably think so, but you know, what's, what's the, uh, the backup to that? We were talking in the last, uh, in, in a recent program about divine right of kings. Yes. You know, what gives such certainty that God is behind you in everything you do and say and demand of others? Well, I, I can't speak to all religions in this, but within Christianity, um, I, I do a, a, a lot of reading in the second and third centuries. And there you, you have an attitude that takes over very early on in Christian history that the church is always right. Uh, Irenaeus argues this in his Against Heresies. Uh, he's, he consistently argues that there's one right reading of Scripture, and that is the reading of the church. Uh, mm -hmm. Origen takes this on in the beginning of his On First Principles, the, 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 the preface to that work, and this is his most significant work, um, the preface of that work, he argues that when the church has spoken, the church is right and there's no arguing with it. And so uh, Tertullian, another person from the early third century, uh, he makes the argument that a heretic not only is wrong, but they don't even have right to dispute with the church because they're wrong. So the idea that the church is right, the church is always right, and this attitude becomes a we are always right, therefore whatever we do is right, whatever we say is right, this becomes the attitude... Yeah, I was at a meeting uh, at Catholic totalitarianism. University uh, where Cardinal uh, Dolan actually paused in his presentation of religious liberty and he, and he looked around at his Catholic audience, very few others than Catholics there, and he said, you know, he says, the church once held that error has no rights. Yeah, and that's Tertullian's position. If you're position. wrong, by definition, you've lost your, your right to be wrong. Th that's correct. Uh, and, and that was asserted in the third century yeah. by Tertullian in so many words, and of course acted upon by many administrators in the future uh, from the third century, so all and, the way and, through the And I ages. think what you're saying also is borne out in the attitude of the church. You could say Rome, but you know, it was the main line for, for, for hundreds of years, almost a thousand plus, uh, the idea that, that whatever the church said, scripture said, was valid, not what you thought it read, uh, said, because in other words, your reading was uninformed and ignorant, and you can read those same words, but it doesn't matter what you think the, 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 the scriptures say. It's yeah. what the church says they say. And, and the, this is one of the, one of the big hermeneutics of the, of the, throughout Christian history is there's no private interpretation of Scripture. You can't have one thing and I have another thing and another guy has another thing. So there's no, no subjectivity, total subjectivity on interpretation of Scripture. And of course, the, the fail-safe that they've always used was, therefore, it's what the church teaches. Mm. The problem with that is if the church makes a mistake, how does the church correct itself from Scripture? Let me use a golf analogy on you. Do you like to golf? Uh, I used to. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I, I enjoy golf. I'm a terrible golfer. Until I got a bad back from doing it. Oh, uh, well, okay. The bad backs. You know about bad backs? Bad, yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of back surgeries myself, and I'm waiting to get back to golf. But when, when I play golf, I play what I call adventure golf. 
you know, when I, when I, you, you know, most people course. try, yeah, you know, <laughs> most people want to keep in the short grass. Well, that's not my style. I did, yeah. When I hit the ball really hard, it can go anywhere. But it's, we have a saying in, in golf, it's uh, bad golfers sayings. It's, it's all about the second shot. All you need mm. with the first shot is distance. The second shot you aim, okay? So that second shot is vital. If, <laughs> if you are getting your interpretation of where you're supposed to go next by looking toward the goal, i.e. That, that flag in the little hole and that, yeah. that little really short grass on the green, everything works fine. But if you're getting your orientation about where you're going by looking back to where you've come from, mm. you can see right away that... Uh, if you go, okay, so I, I, I hook the ball and I'm way, way out to the left here, but I'm going to get my orientation of where I'm going by looking back where I came from. Suddenly, my next shot isn't going anywhere near the hole. It's going way out that way. And two or three shots later, I can be completely off the golf course. Well, I, you know, since this uh, program deals with church state issues yes. under the general rubric of religious liberty, I, I, I'll draw a parallel. It seems to me the Roman Catholic Church in the real world has discovered uh, or realized that it acted improperly at different points. Sure. And there was a document called Memory and Reconciliation uh, where they quote, apologize for the uh, persecution of the Jews, for the Inquisition and, and some other evils. But they did it in a way that was sort of weaselly. They said that uh, just as Christ, uh, pure and undefiled and incapable of error, took upon himself the sins of fallen human beings, the magisterium of the church, pure and undefiled and incapable of error, will apologize for the actions of uh, some of its adherents. It's sort of a non-apology. But the parallel that I would draw, there's a danger even in the US we developed that thinking. You know, there's a, a, a vibrant dis debate that develops every time a public figure appears to apologize for actions of the past. Yeah. And, and I've heard it said, by even uh, presidential candidates. I will never apologize for America. You know, why? Why not? It's, it's not a, a, a divine uh, entity. Uh, it seems to me in the normal human sense, you're stronger for recognizing an error and correcting and going on. Correct. But as you say, you create a conundrum if no matter what's happened in the past, you can't acknowledge it and correct, then you're really uh, at worst uh, or at best, rather, you're off the course, even though you think you're heading in the right direction. There's an interesting uh, um, illustration of this in liturgical history. Uh, that's the study of how the church worships. And, and of course, every church has a tendency to say, well, we worship the way Jesus instructed the, di the disciples to worship. That's how we worship. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the, the history of that claim, you see how the worship changes between second and third century, between third and fourth century, fourth and fifth century. But at every stage it says, no, we're worshiping exactly like Jesus taught the disciples to worship, even though it's always changing. So it has never changed is a statement that is made over and over again in church history when in fact it's demonstrably changed. In, my, in your lifetime. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a slow process. Yeah. So, so the, the church orders of the early church, you know, like you go from, from, uh, from, the, didas, uh, from the Didache to the Didascalia and then on to the, the Constitution of the Twelve Apostles, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are written at different times in different places and present a different liturgy, a different uh, order of, of who's in charge and what's, who's doing which things. But they all claim that this is what Jesus taught the apostles. Yeah. So they all claim that it's never changed. So... so how can an individual deal with this, both with the, the larger church, I mean, they have denominations, but the larger church thinking that yeah. may have been uh, sidetracked by this, uh, these assumptions that are dangerous, or in a, a country like the United States or Australia or whatever, that it's not formally any particular religion, but we're trying to act morally and, 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 and before God. Who do we respond to? Do we take the church authority? Do we take the state authority on spiritual matters? What do we do? 
Well, if you're asking me, I would say we've got to go back to see what Scripture actually says. Right. What were the words of Jesus? What were the context in which he spoke them? How can we get principles from what he meant and apply them to our own situation today? Actually going to uh, what was taught by the prophets of God. And, and this sounds Jesus. like Protestantism or the Protestant well, Reformation. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm being I, facetious. I a, but that, that was the... Uh, the, the, the uh, determination that came out of uh, increased learning and printing and all the rest and people started reading the Bible and they realized that's the only uh, correct way the individual can respond to this. Well the difference in distance between the way the church was acting in the 15th century and what you read in the New Testament is clear to every reader. So if something never changed and it's always been right well then how did it end up so different from what we yeah. read in the New Testament. Yeah. Well, and, and even today, I'm afraid to, way, way too few people that call themselves Christians are very familiar with the Bible. They should be reading it more. Yeah. Uh, all the surveys I've seen, you know, the, the abysmal ignorance on things as basic as, you know, David and Goliath, they don't know these, just the simple stories, which tells me that it's, it's not generally read. I, I, I'm afraid it's like, you know, you and I are both Seventh-day Adventists. We've, from the beginnings of our church, had a, a, a printing publishing ministry and sent books out and around. And, and I often go to, to sidewalk sales or go to people's homes and I see some of these books, pristine binding and all the rest on the shelf. I know they're not read, but they're <laughs> all around. Uh, you know, the Bible is the, uh, uh, arguably uh, the most, if not one of the most widely distributed books, but they're not generally read. You know, there's a difference between having a Bible on your shelf and having a Bible in your head. Yeah. You know, the, the actual physical taking down and reading of Scripture right. is, and, and is something that needs to be there in order to get a, an ability to see for yourself what is being taught in Scripture. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, unregulated or, or, you know, if we're not careful, that can create such a diversity that, that, you know, the system doesn't work. And I think Islam, just plucking an example out of the thin air, suffers a little from that without sort of a central, anything really approaching a central sort of a cohesive element to their faith. It's freelance uh, religion all over and, and, and the wild and wonderful personal interpretations abound. But Christianity has that too. Sure. Uh, but I think we've, we've developed this tension between the individual and freelance theology and, and the structure for a long time in the Catholic Church and then the other major denominations. But somehow we need to personalize it more without sort of balkanizing the whole thing. Well, and, and I think here we must recognize the context in which things were written. Trying to take and interpret scripture without going to the context in which it was written for, to understanding who it was written for, uh, divorces you from the content of what was intended. So if you're going to be so separated from, from the understanding of the context, and then you're just interpreting it based on what it, how it strikes you. I, you read it and you say, okay, so that must mean this, because in my context, that makes sense of this situation. That just... That, that, that makes it so um, nebulous that it has no meaning. So what is the distinction between reading for context and the historical critical method? <laughs> well, let's be fair. The historical critical method, uh, the problem with it is the critical part, not the history part. I like that. That's okay, so if, if I put myself in the driver's seat and say, I always know what's going on and I'm going to judge what can and cannot be true from Scripture, that's critical and I, I'm not there. But if it's historical and you're saying, well, I'm trying to understand what Scripture was intended to mean. So I have to go to the history to find out what it was intended to mean. And then once I find out what it was intended to mean, the history tells me what the principles are. And then I try to derive principles that are applicable to my own situation. Yeah, very good. We'd better take a break. But uh, if you like this line of, of logic, this is deeper than most people are willing to get into it. But it's very relevant and a good way to look at this. Stay with us. and We'll be back to continue the discussion.
Welcome back to the Liberty Insider after a short break. Now we get down to the nitty gritty again. And, yes. and you know, it all comes back to, I, I think, how does the individual relate to this? And, and really, as I said earlier, to the Reformation. The Reformation was, was like a bud opening for, for Christians who were seeking truth. The, the word of God, it's like the truth now is available to anyone, not what someone else tells you. You know, it's interesting because Luther, when he was, when he was pushing into the reform, was very keen on getting rid of anything that he could not demonstrate from Scripture. Yeah. But he, he started backpedaling after the, the peasants' ref, you know, re, oh, yeah. uh, revolution and the slaughter of, of all these peasants. And he, and he, he started backpedaling uh, and saying, well, maybe we should only get rid of those things that are directly against Scripture rather than getting rid of everything if it's not found in Scripture. And, and most groups hit that. I mean, uh, in, the, in the Adventist setting, James White hit that as well. At first, get rid of everything except for what we can prove from Scripture. And then it's like, well, maybe we can't get rid of everything because of the fact that uh, uh, those things that, that are uh, demonstrable in, in Scripture don't cover all the categories that we need to be addressing today. Well, I think from what, the way you're describing it, he had the problem that some of our own members have now. They're sort of on a quest to reinvent everything and to define the whole thing as Christian, where it seems to me the baseline thing of being a Christian should be there, and Adventists have a particular uh, viewpoint for our times and a particular interpretation of one element. But in the main, all of the assumptions and, and uh, advantages of people studying through the ages should be appropriated by us. We're not reinventing the whole thing. And, and it's, it's interesting that you put it in terms of studying through history. You're talking about Bible study through history. Yes. You're talking about people picking up the Bible and reading it through history, right. which is very different than sitting and listening to somebody tell you what to believe. Because a lot of that happened through history too. The oh. church, the church fathers, the church uh, directors, the, the priests and the bishops, and, and even in the Reformation, it becomes the, the new clergy starts telling everybody what to believe. And, and that's not so uh, unusual when you think about it. While they had this, this uh, illumination on, on the need for average person to study the Bible, their whole structure, their mindset, their habits, were exactly as it had been with the Roman Catholic Church for all that time. So it's no, no mystery to me why uh, Calvin and others tended to behave rather similarly when they had sure. the chance. That, that's all they knew. Yeah. Uh, but but the, the reality is they had broken officially from accepting what the church taught as true to needing to find out truth from Scripture. And that's a yeah. big shift. Now, how did we get to that spot of the church is the one who teaches this and that is what is right and nothing else can happen? And what does that mean for Well, I'll go back to the original rights? statement I made. I know that it's the, uh, the, the, the crown jewels uh, for, for, for Rome particularly. It's this statement of Jesus to Peter. Yeah. That, you know, whatever you seal here or whatever you damn here, that'll be done also in heaven. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm not sure anyone, I've never heard anyone uh, uh, totally transparently explain that, but I'm quite certain that it was over applied. It, 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 I mean, it, it would be foolish on its face, except that it's been done by the Jesuits and others, to say that there's something antithetical to God's principles could be enunciated by a church leader here and God would honor such a thing. Can't be. Yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, in, in the in the understanding of what is truth and, and uh, the church is the ones who are the arbiter of it. During, during Cyprian's time in the middle of the third century, um, he, he comes up with three statements that are attempting to try to help to unify the church and clarify things. Mm -hmm. And he, he does it not on himself, by himself. He does it in, in conversation with other bishops and such. But he, he asserts rather strongly, there is no salvation outside the church. He says, the way he puts it is, you cannot have God as your father unless you have the church as your mother. And this only flows if the actions of the church are actually bringing salvation. 
Doesn't that ignore the Jesus statement, other sheep of I not of this pasture? It, it does. It, yeah. it completely flies into the face of many things Jesus says. Uh, uh, come to me, Jesus says, not come to the church. And in and, and the reality, you, you have it that the church ends up saying what we do causes salvation. Now, yeah. interestingly enough, the other two things that are, that are said by Cyprian there is, the, the next one is the church equals the bishops. Where you find the bishop, there you find the church makes it so that it's not all the people that are the church per se, so much as it is the bishop that defines the church. And then the third thing, therefore, only the bishop can forgive sins, or only the bishop is the one who knows adequately enough to declare when someone is forgiven or not. Mm. And so this is the, the idea behind coming to your bishop and, 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 and demonstrating that you know of, of your sins and then getting absolution. Now, I often ask questions where I think I know the answer, but I don't know one to this. Uh, but it just hit me, you know, uh, more and more in the, in the Middle Ages, uh, bishoprics and other uh, church appointments were uh, as much political uh, as, as religious. And so many secular people were put in these positions. So how would they think that a secular person would have any judgment or, or any ability to, to specify spiritual things? Well, the, the official argument kind of goes, it, it, they don't need to, because if they defy the church, then they need to be reprimanded by the church. The yeah. church is the authority. The church is the one that is holding the line. And if one individual is jumping out of line, that's, they will be brought back. Uh, but, but according to Augustine's argument, uh, it is not the, the right actions or the right thinking of the individual that causes the efficacy of the actions of salvation. It mm. is the ordo. It is the fact that they have the Holy Spirit through the ordination of the church. Therefore, what they do is right, even if they themselves are not good people. And I can actually think of one example. That I, before I asked my question, I didn't think of this. But Thomas Beckett seems to be, feels it absolutely wasn't. He, he wasn't a, pr a priest. He had no religious background. Well, he, he had been. He had he, I been thought he trained deacon. briefly, but he, a deacon, he trained yeah. as an archdeacon. He had yeah. gone as far as an archdeacon. But he certainly wasn't in the, the, the church stream of things. He was a very secular type. Yeah. And he goes straight to the top. And right. he's the only saint of both the uh, Church of England and the, uh, and the, and Catholic. the Catholic Church. Yeah. And, and I think what he did was admirable. I mean, in, in, in uh, fighting back, back against the king trying to control the church. But it brings the pendulum too far if he gets what he actually says. Because Beckett was arguing the church uh, line yeah, oh, against the king. Yeah. And what, what we view him as today as balancing a, an, an, out of, an out of control king. But he well, was that's true if he'd been left to his own devices. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> cause according to him, there, the church does no wrong. And therefore, it, it has to be, everything has to be judged for, by the, all priests, no matter if they're doing right or wrong, need to be judged only by the church. Yeah, there, and you're right. I was about to bring know. up that point. Uh, a big part of the English Reformation of, of, of Henry VIII wasn't just justifying his marriage or even uh, bringing himself into line with some of the theological... Uh, developments that were part of the Reformation. There was this antipathy to the independence of the church that had its own church courts in opposition to civil courts, and in particular with the priests, although anybody could go to a church court, but the priests, you know... Could only go to church courts. Right, and, and they, they would do egregious things and the church would wrap them on the knuckles, you know, a few Hail Marys and you're okay in here, you know. And, and, and then, of course, the other thing that, that is a big part of it in England, they, the state wanted the uh, properties that the church had because oh, it had course. become a competing uh, entity. Well, not uh, just competing. Uh, by, the time, by the time you get to Henry's reign, approximately 60% of the land mass belonged to the church yeah, because right. every generation would, right. would donate more to the church and the church would away. just keep it. And, yeah. and keep. So that was the first act to appropriate all of that property for the state. Right. And, and, and you know, that's not in itself a good thing, but it was, it was a, a, a setting things straight from an overbalance of the church taking all of this, this, uh, this property, pr uh, prerogatives, and, 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 and even on civil law. But there you have two competing ideas of who's And neither one of them is, is, is in balance. You're and, right. And good if, point. You get, if you get one of them too strong, they imbalance it their direction. The other one gets too strong, they imbalance it yeah. their direction. But going back to Cyprian for a minute, Cyprian actually had... A, a caveat that he gave. Only the bishops can forgive sins, he said. 
and there's no salvation outside the church. But he said, in a caveat, if the church makes a mistake, God will overrule. And the caveat is not quoted very often by those who are applying Cyprian's laws. Well, we say that today, you know, well, God will set things straight. I don't think he does against human nature and human uh, error. It, it, you know, if we want to sell the church to, to the devil himself, unfortunately, that will happen. Right, uh, but, but we're God talking moves about upon salvation. hearts, not upon actions against the heart. Right, but in, but in the context here, Cyprian's talking about salvation itself. And, and in the area of salvation, Cyprian argues that the church has the right to forgive or not to forgive, to withhold forgiveness or to give forgiveness. But if the church makes a mistake, God will intervene. That part was forgotten for most of the Middle Ages. A few years ago, the Roman Catholic Church came out with a very interesting document called Memory and Reconciliation. And I give them credit for wanting to divest themselves of some of the more embarrassing past episodes of church history. Things like the persecution of the Jews, the uh, uh, Crusades and so on. But in reality, it's not that easily done, especially as that document was a bit disingenuous and reserved the magisterium to be sort of beyond uh, fault. But when we come to the end of our days and when human beings come to the end of, of days and uh, face the judgment bar of God, uh, we can't escape our actions. We can only ask for forgiveness for them. And uh, the Reformation, I think, brought us quite a way toward that realization that we stand as, as uh, individual beings before God and we're responsible for our actions, but ultimately God forgives and that's the hope that I think stands before us. That's the goal that we're striving to for emphasizing individual conscience, religious liberty and freedom for all. For Liberty Insider, this is Lincoln Steed.